Good evening and welcome to our fourth talk of the C4 convention. Uh, this is the third and final Newman lecture of the series and we'll be hearing from John Kralievich this hour. Um, I'm sure he needs little introduction. Um, he's very well known in the industry as a contributor to the Red Book um, catalog. He has cataloged many different important collections, including the Pogue collection. Uh, he's a member of the Rittenhouse Society and a fellow of the ANS. The list goes on and on. So I will get out of the way and let him talk. Uh, John, you are still muted, so you'll want to be sure to unmute yourself. There you go. Great. Alrighty. Thank you, Liana. Appreciate no it very problem. much. And, and, and thank you all for, for joining us. Um, hopefully you're all sitting around in your basements in your pajamas. Uh, I, I said to my wife that I should probably do this talk um, while also in my pajamas, but she encouraged me to put actual clothes on. So uh, you can thank my wife for the fact that I'm, I'm wearing a shirt with a collar. Uh, so uh, we've been around each other for a long time. Uh, we see four folks. It's been uh, you know more than 20 years that, that I've been involved in this group, I think since 1994. And since we've been around together for a long time, uh, we find that that sometimes history rhymes or at least runs in circles. And as I was um, uh, doing a little bit of work on my CV here recently, I discovered that I gave a very similar talk uh, to this one, uh, to this exact same group in 2014, which I had completely forgotten about. And I imagine that many of you were in attendance and you probably also forgot about it. Uh, so the good thing is, uh, on this particular topic, I've learned a lot in those last six years, uh, so hopefully uh, either what I present is new and fresh, or you, like me, have completely forgot what I said six years ago, uh, and therefore um, uh, you're, uh, you're ready to hear it all over again, fresh and new. So anyway, the, uh, the, the title tonight, The Immigrants' Sources and Methods, and so we're going to be talking about uh, the coins that circulated in early America uh, that were not from here. Uh, and as most of you probably know at this point, that was most of them. There were, there were very, very few coins actually made in North America, uh, really up until the, the first decade of the, of the first United States Mint. So we have coins from all over the world pouring in here. Uh, and as it is, as we sit here in 2020 as numismatists and as historians, we know an awful lot about what was here. Uh, we don't have to guess. Um, we are constantly surprised by, by new things that turn up because of new sources that are found or new ways to look at old sources. Um, but we know a, a great deal about what was in the pockets of our colonial forefather, uh, forefathers and foremothers, um, really going all the way back to the, the 16th century. Uh, so the question that, that we're going to try to answer here in the next hour or so uh, or at least until I have to get off of here and let the dogs out or in or something. Uh, the question we're going to try to answer is how do we know that? How do we know what coins uh, were circulating and what became the United States um, in the primarily 17th and 18th centuries? Um, this is not a talk about those coins per se. That's a really big topic. And, and someday I'll actually uh, write a book on that topic and, and catalog them and talk about the, the proportionality of them and where they circulated and, and, and also remind people that colonial history is a very broad period of time. And the, the first people start turning up who weren't actually from here. Uh, in the 16th century, we have, we have visitors here in the 1500s who left coins behind. And, and the colonial period, of course, stretches uh, all the way up until um, the 1770s or 1780s, depending upon how you define it. I, I say 1784, because that's when we officially ended the uh, Revolutionary War, but you can, you can uh, pick another date and your mileage may vary. So that's a very broad period of time. And not all of these coins were here uh, in all of those eras. So let's not telescope it all into sort of one moment and call that moment colonial times, because that's a, a very, very long period of time. But anyway, this talk is not about the coins. It's about how we know what we know, about the sources and methods we can use to confirm what we think we know already and to discover new coins that, that maybe we wouldn't want to incorporate into our, our, our collections as things that the colonists may have seen. So there are, there are two basic kinds of evidence uh, that we rely upon to figure out what coins were here in the, again, primarily 17th and 18th centuries. And those basic kinds of sources are physical and documentary. Now, how do we break that down? Among physical sources, in other words, tangible things that we could hold and study and, and maybe even collect, 
You've got things like hordes, which includes wet hordes or shipwrecks, uh, archaeological finds, things found under very precise uh, archaeological condi uh, conditions by academic archaeologists, uh, individual finds, things people find on the beach or in their garden or perhaps by metal detector, uh, things like coin weights, uh, imitations and counterfeits of the foreign coins that were in circulation here, uh, American-made coins, and we'll talk about why certain American-made types are relevant to this conversation when we get to them, uh, coins that have counter stamps or have regulation marks, overstrikes, and coins with engraving on them. Among documentary kinds of information, um, we have uh, things like laws, uh, we have things like almanacs, which I know some of you already collect because occasionally you outbid me for them on eBay. Uh, labels for coin scales, uh, newspapers, literary sources, both fiction and nonfiction of the era have hints sometimes. Uh, manuscripts of all sorts, uh, paper money, uh, and even things like names on a map can help inform our information here. And I see a, a question blinking at me in the question and answer chat. Um, we'll get to all that at the end, uh, I think is probably the, the best way to do it. But if you do have a question, go ahead and plug it in there and then we'll, we'll cycle through and, and answer it. Um, now, all of these sources that we're talking about, these physical and documentary sources, these are all primary sources. In other words, firsthand accounts from the era uh, of people that, that saw or encountered things or the actual objects that were there. Um, these are not secondary sources. When I write an article, in the numismatist or coin world or someplace else, that's a secondary source. This presentation is a secondary source. Uh, some auction cataloger saying you should buy this coin because the colonists had one just like it, that's a secondary source. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about primary sources and how those inform this information. All right, so let's start at the beginning uh, with one of my favorite kinds of physical evidence uh, for what, what circulated in early America, hordes and shipwrecks. And uh, I think a lot of you have figured out that, that collecting coins from well-known early American shipwrecks is a great way to not only learn more about what the colonists saw, but to actually be able to own a coin that we know was there. If you buy a coin from the Feversham, and there in the, in the lower left, you see the catalog cover from the 1989 Christie sale uh, of the Feversham wreck, the first of several that, that included coins from the wreck of the Feversham. When you get a coin from the Feversham, you know that coin was in New York City in 1711. Sure, when it, when it actually ended its journey off of Nova Scotia uh, in a storm that year, uh, it ended up being in, in Canadian waters. But when that ship took on those coins at the, at the sub-treasury in New York, they pulled them right out of pocket change. Um, so we know that every coin on that, on that shipwreck was kicking around lower Manhattan in 1711, which is great information. It gives us a very precise place. It gives us a very precise time. Uh, and the nice thing about shipwrecks, uh, you know, whether, whether they're uh, for-profit expeditions, which most of them are, um, the way the Canadians do it, they rent the site out to commercial uh, uh, wreck hunters, or if it's a more archaeological thing, they tend to very, very carefully document what came up. So if you look through that catalog and then subsequent Feversham catalogs, um, you're able to see uh, not just what was circulating, but, but you see the proportions. If you see one lion dollar and 10 eight reals, eh, that's probably a pretty random selection. The one caveat I will give with Canadian shipwrecks in particular, uh, base metal coins uh, that are found on Canadian shipwrecks, things like the Feversham, uh, things like the Tillsbury, uh, which sank in 1757, or the Auguste, which sank in 1761. Uh, there, the finders are able to sell gold and silver, any kind of precious metal or specie coins. Um, but uh, things that are made of base metal go right into the collections of Parks Canada. So if there were half pennies, uh, if there were other kinds of base metal coinage found on those wrecks, those typically would not make it to the marketplace. They're not supposed to, at least, from Canadian wrecks. Uh, the Faithful Steward is a wreck uh, that sank in, in American waters um, off of the uh, Delaware River Inlet, uh, off the coast of what's today Lewis, Delaware. Uh, it's primarily known for yielding Irish halfpence, uh, although some gold coins do come up also. Uh, and those are easy to find in the marketplace. And if you get one of those, it never quite made it to American soil, but that gives us a good indication of the kinds of, of coppers uh, that were being imported in 1785 uh, into the Philadelphia market. Uh, and there on the right hand side, we see a, an early photograph of some of the coins that made it into the main historical society from the famous Castine deposit, uh, which was probably lost about 1704, I should say, probably deposited about 1704. And it's such a neat mix of coins, and it's an unexpected mix of coins, 
because not only does it have the kinds of things you would expect to find in coastal New England in, in the, the first quarter of the 18th century, uh, things like some French coins, things like some pine tree shillings, uh, the lion dollars, but you've got a, a, a rare Colombian eight real cob, um, which tells us that just because a coin is rare in today's numismatic marketplace doesn't mean it didn't circulate here uh, in early America. You've, you've got gold coins, you've got a, a mainland Spanish type, you've got early Portuguese silver coins, which though they might not as be as common as, as say pieces of eight or something like that, were here and were recognizable uh, to early Americans. So archaeological finds, these are harder to collect because ideally if it's being found by an archaeologist, it's being kept in archaeological uh, collection, usually at a museum or a university. So these tend not to make it into the marketplace. Um, this is a, a form of information, a source that is sometimes hard to get our, our uh, arms around for two reasons. Uh, archaeologists don't tend to publish in numismatic circles. We have to actually go bird dog this stuff where they publish it, which tends to be in archaeological circles. And also because the archaeologists uh, are, are typically historians or historical archaeologists, they're not necessarily numismatists. And sometimes they have trouble identifying stuff that comes out of the ground looking pretty wrecked. Um, uh, we can be helpful to that. Um, they will sometimes take our advice. Uh, so if you ever uh, have the opportunity to get in touch with a local archaeologist, if you were uh, in an area that actually had um, digs of this era and want to lend your expertise, they'd, they'd certainly be glad to have it. Um, but if you look through particularly older archaeological uh, find reports, you often have things that are very vaguely um, uh, attributed. So sometimes that's challenging if we're just, you know, doing our, our, our Google digging. Uh, there on the left, you see a pile of uh, 1601 1602 Irish uh, half pence and pence uh, from the era of Queen Elizabeth. Those were all dug uh, within the fort at James Fort at Jamestown, Virginia. Uh, those are currently on display uh, at the Archaearium there at, at Jamestown. Uh, and on the right hand side, there, there's something more unusual. It's a, a fairly commonplace um, Caribbean type. Uh, this was marked for Tobago in the first decade of the 19th century, uh, counterstamped atop a, a circulating counterfeit 1749 Sumark, uh, probably of, of Birmingham uh, English manufacture. Uh, and a lot of these early Caribbean coins, we sort of think of the Caribbean as something different. But the amount of interaction between American ports and the Caribbean means that there was a lot of exchange of these coins. So it's not surprising that a coin like this would turn up in the middle of Baltimore, in Fells Point. If we were actually in Baltimore, if there wasn't this terrible pandemic thing going on, uh, we might be sitting having a beer within a couple of blocks of where this thing was found. So uh, I think uh, that's a particularly interesting coin, not only because uh, it's a, a Caribbean coin that might be unexpected to find here, but because I really wish we were on Baltimore right now. All right, next. Metal detector sources. We all love stuff that comes up from metal detectorists. Um, metal detectorists uh, have become more a part of our uh, numismatic hobby in recent years and have found groups like C4 and they've taught us so much and we can often teach them a lot too. So I'm really glad that, that metal detectorists have sort of become part of our um, bizarre little corner of the hobby. Um, they have so much to add because these guys that actually, I say guys, it's a lot of women as well. These folks that go out there and do the work and swing their detector around, they know their area, they know the history of their area. And oftentimes, you know, they might not be technical numismatists, but they know the coinage that they find as well or better than the, the people that we associate as C4 experts. Um, and they find some pretty surprising stuff sometimes. There at the, um, at the bottom center is a, a coin from, from Naples when it was uh, uh, controlled by the, the emperor, the Holy Roman Emperor, the, the um, Spanish King uh, Carlos V, uh, that was found in coastal South Carolina, um, quite possibly left behind by one of the 16th century uh, short-lived settlements down there. You can see more typical things in some of these other pictures, um, uh, British halfpence, uh, genuine ones uh, in these cases, uh, though a counterfeit one is over there on the left, um, Spanish colonial cobs, uh, cut quarters of an eight real. Uh, so they, they find things that we expect and they sometimes surprise us too. So metal detectorists can be a great form, uh, a great source of this kind of information. Now, that being said, just because someone found it with a metal detector does not mean we should put it in a book about what foreign coins circulated in early America. This is a very modern, very crummy copy of a uh, Spanish colonial cob that is probably eh, 10 years old that someone lost on a beach in Florida. It happens. They left Disneyland, they put their souvenir in their pocket, or they left 
a gift shop in St. Augustine and it goes into the sand. So just because it was dug up here doesn't mean it's necessarily uh, the gospel truth about what was here 300 years ago. All right. And so sometimes you encounter things like this too. If you uh, uh, happen to be a, a visitor in the, in the metal detector groups on, on Facebook, um, this coin was dug up in my backyard here in Northwest Montana. Um, we know that the story is accurate about the dog digging it up because the, the dog hair is, is excellent evidence of that. Um, but the coin, uh, unfortunately, is not as real as the story. This is a, a modern fake cob that someone lost in their garden in Montana. It happens. Uh, eBay is a, a great source of both information and acquisition of, of these kinds of foreign coins that were uh, dug up that had been circulating in early America, but that doesn't mean it's necessarily 100% accurate. Uh, there's been a couple of sellers on eBay, I don't know if it's the same person who's changed their name or what, who has attributed all manner of really, really ugly um, uh, coins of this era uh, to having been dug up near the Saratoga battlefield. They've been selling for years. Um, and a little bit of common sense in looking at uh, eBay listings will sometimes tell you um, that the story is not necessarily accurate and is just um, uh, somewhere between puffery and an outright lie. Uh, notice the listing here does not say it was dug up in Boston Spa. It just says dug Boston Spa. Uh, the price is inexpensive. It's a really ugly coin that doesn't look like it was dug anytime recently. The seller is not in that area. The seller's in Los Angeles. Um, and uh, if, you, if you scroll down to the listing of this particular one, it just says dug with a metal detector. There's no more precision or anything like that. Uh, and if there's somebody on, on eBay, you know, selling bowling shoes and, and, you know, broken jewelry and all sorts of stuff, and then happens to have 50 coins they say were found in the same place, use your best judgment. I know this will surprise you, but sometimes people don't tell the truth on eBay. I know. I was disappointed when I found that out too. But fortunately, some people do. So here's a seller that I've done a fair bit of business with, and some of y'all may recognize the listing. And, and this is the kind of, of listing on eBay uh, that you might actually recognize as someone who's doing the digging themselves or is selling on behalf of a digger um, with the kind of information and the kind of coin uh, that, that, uh, that where the story and the coin matches. We know cut pistorines primarily come out of Virginia. Uh, we know they're primarily found by people looking for Civil War uh, artifacts or Civil War relics. Uh, this particular seller uh, says more or less where it was found without being too terribly precise. They point out that it was found on private property with permission, which is sort of an important thing uh, that metal detectorists often say to show that they're an ethical hunter. Um, and in this particular listing, I have no reason to doubt that this coin was found um, exactly where it was. So. All right, uh, Dennis has a comment here. A point of information, the coins found near Castine include one or two that were found in the 1860s um, per the logbook at the Maine Historical Society. No, he had it right in his monograph. Yes, that's true. Sometimes um, with hoards, uh, they, they scoop up a whole bunch of things and say everything was deposited at the same time and uh, you end up getting some, some trash with some treasure. So that's, that's, thank you for pointing that out, Dennis. That is, that is entirely accurate. All right, another good uh, or interesting source of information, although not quite as commonplace uh, as metal detector finds, coin weights. Um, metal detectorists or archaeologists sometimes find coin weights. And the neat thing about finding a coin weight in the ground in America means that if the coin weight was in America, there's a pretty good chance that the coin that it aligns with was also used in America. So that's a, another form uh, of evidence. You've got a, a coin weight uh, there on the bottom that, that looks like it was photographed on someone's bath mat um, that was found in Virginia for a, uh, a Spanish eight real. I think it's an eight real type. Uh, and the one on the right is neat. That's a Queen Anne guinea weight. Uh, and that actually came off of the Queen Anne's Revenge, which was Blackbeard ship, which sank uh, off the coast of North Carolina. Uh, so Blackbeard not only had a uh, coin scale on board, uh, but he was apparently weighing guineas there. All right, imitations and counterfeits. You can, you can learn a lot about what was circulating from counterfeits. So counterfeiters, when you boil right down to it, they're business people. They're trying to make a living. Not in the most honest way, but they're trying to make a living. They're going to counterfeit things that are going to be familiar and will pass easily. They're not trying to counterfeit things that's going to make a, a merchant or a, a, a consumer in 1780 Philadelphia go, oh, look at this unusual thing. They want something that will blend right in. So that means they're going to counterfeit things that will be easily recognizable and not heavily scrutinized. So that means, say, at Mason's Mills, if they're making a George II counterfeit halfpenny, 
there's a fair number of George II counterfeit half pennies still kicking around the Hudson River Valley in the late 1780s. That's good to know. That's good information. The uh, Philadelphia Highway coin find um, uh, cast uh, half pence, primarily William III, uh, probably deposited in the first quarter of the 18th century, right near the Philadelphia waterfront. Uh, the fact that they were casting William III halfpence means they had William III halfpence to cast. So we know that those coins were kicking around Philadelphia 50 years before the Declaration of Independence. So that's very, very valuable information. All right, so at the, at the, at the jump, we tease that sometimes American-made coins uh, betray the foreign coins that circulate alongside of them. If you look at the designs of a Connecticut or Vermont mailed bus left, uh, a coin that was intended to blend into circulation, it might suggest to you that the folks that were going to be spending these things would be very familiar with George II halfpence. Uh, and it's also interesting that things like, say, a Vermont landscape was quickly abandoned, and these more, say, familiar types were chosen because they would just blend in easier. They would be easier to spend than something that looked exotic or different and potentially untrustworthy. Um, this is one reason that we don't change our money much in the United States, whether it be paper money or coins, is because we know that, that people put their trust in the familiar. Here you have uh, folks in Vermont and, uh, and Connecticut uh, basically uh, acknowledging the fact that, that consumers and merchants were putting their trust in the familiar and copying the designs of a George II halfpenny. All right. One of the coolest forms of physical evidence of foreign coins in early America are the coins that wear where they've been like a steamer trunk with stickers on it. We know that that little Colombian cob, it's a, I believe a one escudo if memory serves there on the left-hand side. We know that was in Philadelphia. We know it crossed Philip Singh's desk. That's cool. Uh, we know precisely when and where down to the address that coin was at a pretty particular period of time. Uh, the brazier marked Guinea there at center. We know that that was on Maiden Lane in Lower Manhattan, probably about 1784. That's very precise. That's really great information. And there on the right-hand side, uh, the, the Forbes partnership of silversmiths was active in New York. Uh, the last 20 years and first 10 years, last 20 years of the 18th century and first 10 years of the 19th century. Uh, and there we see a, a 1790 transitional type, uh, Carlos IV to Real um, that was there. Um, with merchant countermarks, um, you're typically going to see merchant countermarks that date from the 1840s and 1850s when that kind of advertising was most common. Um, sometimes you'll see very, very worn out coins, um, which indicate that those coins had probably been kicking around here a while. Um, but counter stamps in terms of merchant counter stamps are most useful to determine what coins were circulating in America in the 19th century. Um, so, so they're of less use if we're talking strictly about the 18th or earlier uh, centuries. With the regulated coins, they're neat because regulation pretty much died out in America before 1790. Uh, it really peaked in the 1780s, um, but, but was being used as a, as a form of, of uh, coinage manipulation, I guess you could call it, a form of increasing the ability of a coin to circulate as early as the 1760s. But still, that's a pretty narrow window. So when you get a regulated gold coin, or rarely a silver coin, it's probably in that era. Um, now, in terms of regulated silver, we know there were plug date reals, uh, not marked, but plugged, aboard the Feversham. So these are, are coins that were already being plugged and brought up to weight as early as 1711. Uh, and, and, uh, and that phenomenon had probably been going on in New York and New England for decades at that time. But again, without, without the merchant countermarks, it really allow us to nail it down. All right, so another kind of form of counter stamp is to counter stamp a coin with a whole nother set of dies. Um, and uh, those of you that know the kind of stuff that I like and collect know that I've, I've been fond of overstrikes for a very long time. I think these are just neat as can be. Um, these New Jersey's kind of sum up the attraction, three of them here uh, on the far left, one that's struck over a uh, Spanish Tumera Vetti. Uh, at center, you've got uh, one struck over a cast counterfeit George II halfpenny. And there on the right-hand side, one that struck over a French soul. Uh, New Jersey overstrikes run the gamut. All sorts of coins. Um, the the uh, jersey on the left is, I believe, the lightest known New Jersey, and the one on the right is the heaviest known New Jersey. Uh, there are obviously certain varieties that come overstruck, but this tells us that all of these undertypes 
were kicking around at the at the time these coins were struck and in the place these coins were struck. So whether that be uh, Newburg or uh, Rahway or wherever else, Morristown, wherever those New Jerseys were being struck at that time, we know that these kinds of foreign coppers were there at that moment. Uh, New Jersey's, of course, aren't the only kinds of overstrikes we have um, in uh, the early American coin series. Vermont's come overstruck, um, uh, oftentimes on Irish halfpence, often counterfeit Irish halfpence. The silver gets pieces, the gets half dollars, typically come overstruck on everything from a Germanic half dollar uh, to a full real. Uh, there's one in a French half écu. Don't sleep on uh, coins that where the foreign types are on top and the American coin is the host. That uh, copper looking Ada Scudos piece on the right slightly postdates our time period, uh, but serves to, to make an important point. Um, that, that Ada Scudo is a, a trial piece on top of a large cent. In this case, it's a, it's a classic head large cent. So, you know, 18, 18, uh, 8 to 1814 or thereabouts. Um, so we know that that Ada Scudos, that counterfeit Ada Scudos, is probably of American manufacture. The odds are much better that an American was making Ada Scudos here, we know that was happening, as opposed to say some Colombian guy happened to have a US large cent in his pocket. Not impossible, but unlikely. Uh, so this is also useful uh, when you find a foreign coin on an early American host to know that that particular set of dies is probably an American made counterfeit. Engraved coins, we all love these things. Um, it is often difficult to uh, determine or, uh, or, or uh, differentiate between American and English engraving unless they really say so in a very precise way. This, this uh, William III shilling uh, that was engraved as a birth commemorative in Philadelphia in 1779, if it says Philly, odds are it was engraved here, not in London. Uh, and that's fascinating because you've got this worn out William III shilling that was still kicking around Philly uh, in the era of the American Revolution. So that's a, a pretty special piece. That copper piece on the right hand side came out of the Ford collection, American Congress, 1778. Um, uh, obviously, engraved coins, you have to be able to recognize period engraving. Uh, there are plenty of things that were um, engraved later to make them seem cool, although that's a, a problem that, that more um, uh, befalls coins of, say, the Civil War era. Um, you see a, a fair number of fantasy engravings from that era. Um, with these coins, things that we can definitively pin down as American engraving are pretty unusual. So if you see something like this, it's a, it's a nice thing to add to your collection. All right, paperwork. Maybe less exciting than coins? I don't know. I love this stuff. Maybe, maybe I'm the only one. Uh, laws are a great form of, of, of documentary evidence. Um, on the right-hand side, you've got the Second Congress in 1792 uh, passing their act to regulate foreign coins, and they actually say which foreign coins they're regulating. They talk about the gold coins of France, Spain, and the dominions of Spain. Uh, if they're passing a law about it, that means that those coins were probably here. Laws generally generally uh, treat problems that actually exist. Um, but laws also uh, talk about things like counterfeiting. If they're, um, uh, if they're forbidding the counterfeiting of lion dollars in New York, they probably wouldn't pass that law unless there were lion dollars in New York. So sometimes you have to dig one step deeper, but, but laws can have some uh, very good information about them. And of course, the things that go with laws, law breakers, uh, if you're reading about counterfeiters or things of this nature, or people who are over clipping things in uh, essentially 18th century police briefs, uh, that's a very, very valuable source of information as well. Uh, there on the left hand side is an act passed by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts uh, in 1784, uh, listing the proper weights and values of things like English and French crowns, English guinea, uh, a moidor, which is a, a Portuguese piece, uh, and other items. Uh, and this is valuable because it's so geographically precise. We know that these coins were kicking around uh, in Massachusetts. Um, uh, Dennis is, is pointing out that the American Congress was a ship. Uh, which makes sense. That's uh, there's a lot of these engraved things that that uh, have sort of a naval uh, connection. And Dennis, don't feel bad. I was also outbid on that coin uh, in the Ford sale. Uh, so uh, going along with with laws as uh, ways to know what foreign coins were here, almanacs and related sorts of literature, things like cambists, which were basically bankers' manuals, uh, and other little books relating to uh, business types of things, um, oftentimes have coin charts in them 
have tables in them, have references to how to calculate certain kinds of coins. Uh, early math textbooks, if you find math textbooks from the 18th century, they will often have word problems relating to uh, calculating one kind of coinage into another kind of coinage. Um, there's a lot of this kind of stuff out there. And uh, sometimes you can really hit the jackpot and find something really distinctive and unusual. Um, the, the booklet there on the left-hand side is little. It's about two and a half inches tall. It was printed in Boston in 1750, which as many of you know, uh, was right after the mermaid brought in an influx of specie uh, and halfpence and farthings from England. So there's all this new coinage uh, in circulation. Uh, so not only was that little booklet uh, meant to translate from old tenor to new tenor in Massachusetts paper money, but also to help people wrap their head around all of these coins that are turning up in circulation uh, at that point. Uh, the, the almanac in the middle there, uh, actually, I brought show and tell. Uh, so that's this almanac from 1762. Oh my God, it's backwards. Um, so that was printed in Boston in 1762 uh, and gives us exactly what we might find um, in Boston. Table of weight and value of coins as they pass in Massachusetts Bay, Connecticut, New York, and Philadelphia. Um, and uh, interesting uh, details there in the text on the bottom. The American Negotiator published in London in 1761 for the merchant class. Um, it was a, a useful reference then, is a useful reference now, uh, and fortunately was, was pretty commonplace back then. So it's, it's relatively easy to acquire a copy, or you can do what I did to get this image and just get it right off of Google Books. So this is kind of a fun thing. This is from the collection of the Massachusetts Historical Society. Uh, Thomas Jefferson's memorandum book was essentially an interleaved almanac. Uh, and when he was in Philadelphia in July 1776, keeping careful notes on, on every time he uh, uh, paid someone to pick up his luggage or, or paid a, a toll to cross a bridge, uh, he made a little note in this almanac, but in that almanac was this exact coin chart. So this was Jefferson's own coin chart uh, from the, the month that the Declaration of Independence was passed. Neat item. So uh, relatedly, uh, coin charts also appear uh, sometimes set into the labels of coin scales of this era. On the right, you see one uh, that is uh, printed uh, on a scale that was sold by Joseph Richardson, who uh, of course was a, an assayer uh, and a goldsmith in Philadelphia, a regulator. Um, and uh, uh, later his son became an assayer at the first US Mint. Uh, and the, the box there on the right was from a, a Philadelphia merchant named William Pointel. Um, so these were, were specially made for the Philadelphia market. You can find um, coin scales with labels that are uh, English or French or, or Germany or from, uh, from Germany or whatever, but the American ones are, are particularly special and important for our purposes. Newspapers. You could, you could go down the rabbit hole. You can get, get lost for years looking through newspapers for references to old coins. Uh, this one on the screen comes from Charles from South Carolina in 1766. A guy is selling rum, and he's telling you he'll take uh, your dollars at 32 shillings, sixpence, South Carolina money of account or South Carolina paper money, uh, pistols at six pounds, guineas, half, uh, uh, half Joes or half Johannes's, and other pieces of gold in proportion. So uh, other, other uh, uh, diminutions of the Portuguese gold uh, for fine old Jamaica, West India, and northward rum. Uh, so these, uh, these kinds of advertisements are valuable. You'll find advertisements about all sorts of things. Uh, I, I lost my wallet. And uh, in that wallet was such and such kind of paper money and three coins. Uh, someone broke into my house and they stole the following coins off my desk. Um, I will give a reward of three pistols for the return of my slave, all sorts of things. And many times they will not just uh, say what kind of, of money they're looking for. In other words, you know, three pounds Pennsylvania currency or four pounds sterling or whatever. But many times they're so precise about the exact kinds of coins. So you could really get lost with a newspapers.com subscription and looking for this kind of stuff. And of course, there's always news about counterfeiters. Um, people love to read about criminals then like now. Uh, I'm guessing I'm not the only one who, uh, uh, only person here who, who uh, lives with someone who listens to real crime podcasts all the time. Uh, the real crime podcast of the 18th century were these very detailed stories about gangs of counterfeiters who often lived out in the woods uh, and this particular gang of counterfeiters described in the Virginia Gazette from Williamsburg in June 1773, uh, they were uh, found at their shop with all manner of uh, engraving tools, a large quantity of paper, uh, and dies for guineas, half joes, doubloons, dollars, and a large number of Virginia five-pound bills. 
Um, if you look at the work of Kenneth Scott, um, who published uh, individual monographs on every, just about every colony, uh, and then a, a broader uh, book called Counterfeiting in Colonial America. He really does a good job, I say does, this is from 60 years ago, did a good job of harnessing the primary sources and publishing them um, uh, as they were printed so that you can almost use that um, with the same sort of, uh, of, of faithfulness that you would use a primary source. Literary sources, all kinds of books have references. Poetry has references to coins, uh, travel logs, all kinds of stuff. Um, this particular stuff is from a travel log um, that was uh, written in 1774 and 1775 by a Scot named Patrick McRobert. Uh, and he traveled all over the place. And uh, the paragraph that I have a screenshot here uh, in New York, he talked about the current coins here in gold are the, uh, the Joe, the Moidor, and some guineas. Notice he, he talks about the Joe first and then some guineas. So we know uh, some idea of proportionality there. He talks about um, what kind of silver there was, again, primarily Spanish colonial silver, but they also have some British shillings. So we know that they were much less common um, when he was in New York, uh, despite the fact that there was British troops all over the place. Um, much less common um, than, than Spanish colonial silver. Uh, and he even put in a, a coin chart uh, in his original reference uh, that was uh, retype set when the, um, when the book was published uh, in the 1930s. Now, I love manuscript stuff. You could spend a lifetime hunting for this stuff and I've been hunting for it for something close to 30 years at this point. Um, uh, you can get letters, you can get estate inventories, uh, you can find uh, letters from, you know, famous founders and the expensive autographs and all this kind of stuff. And you can get receipts from absolute nobodies where they say they traded, you know, a, a, a side of mutton for three Joes or four British shillings or what have you. Uh, on the left hand side here, we've got a receipt uh, from a, uh, a Continental Army camp in New York called Camp Pon Pon in 1782. Uh, received of Major William Alexander 20 silver dollars. Uh, so we know that those are probably eight reals. One of my favorite pieces in my personal collection there in the uh, lower right um, is a bill of exchange written in what they called Mississippi in August 1775. Uh, and from the county where it was made payable, we know this is actually along the Mississippi River in what's today Southern Illinois. There was no white people in Southern Illinois in 1775. I mean, this was the absolute middle of nowhere. But here we have a bill of exchange for 86 milled dollars. So uh, pretty fascinating stuff and very unusual to find something from uh, that far in the hinterlands that actually identifies an exact kind of coin. So that, that makes this particular piece kind of special. Um, now, of course, you can collect this stuff and you can spend a lifetime looking at autograph sales and eBay and piles of old paper, wherever you might find them. Uh, but you can also go right to the, the online archives of so many of our founders and do keyword searches and that sort of thing and, and find things as well. Um, here's a letter that George Washington wrote to Robert Morris uh, reporting in 1782 that the commissioners have returned one eighth, uh, 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 returned me eight and one quarter doubloons five Moidors, four half Joes, 21 English shillings, and five French guineas. I'm sorry, 21 English guineas and five French guineas or, or um, uh, French Louis d'Or, uh, which I shall apply to the use of my family. So I will, I will take that specie and stick it right in my pocket. Thanks very much. Uh, and this was not written in Washington's hand. This is actually in Tench Tillman's hand. He was serving as his aide de camp at that point. Um, but it's pretty neat to imagine that pile of gold coins ending up right in Washington's hand and ending up right in his pocket. So that's a cool letter. And this particular letter is in the uh, Library of Congress today. All right, how about paper money? Paper money makes references to uh, foreign coins that circulated in early America. In Maryland in 1767, they actually illustrated um, Spanish type eight reals on the very first dollar denominated currency in America. Um, Maryland was the, the first colony to switch over to dollars in 1767 and made subsequent issues in 1770 and 1774 that used those same kind of crude woodcuts. Uh, the interesting thing about the woodcuts is they actually depict uh, Spanish mainland type uh, eight reals or, or some subsidiary thereof. 
in Virginia in 1775, they had a pistarine note. We know from archaeology, we know from metal detectorists how common the pistarine, the Spanish style two real, and particularly its cut quarter and half fractions, how common those were in circulation. Uh, when Jefferson wrote his notes on coinage in 1784, he talked about the pistarine and said it's a, a coin perfectly familiar to us all. And when he conceived the idea of a dime, of a one-tenth dollar piece, he said that it would be easily accepted because it's just like a half pistarine. So in Virginia, it's probably no surprise um, that they actually issued a one shilling three pence, a 15 pence note, and defined it as a pistarine, which is a, a, a pretty cool note. It's not too hard to find. This particular one is signed by Edmund, Edmund Randolph, who later served as Washington's uh, uh, attorney general. Uh, but that's kind of the most classic of all of the uh, early American uh, foreign coin reference notes. Now, a little bit later, uh, post-colonial, you get these fascinating script notes in places like Kentucky that actually depict a one-quarter cut of an eight real. And, and the Ohio River Valley uh, in post-colonial times in the first quarter of the 19th century, uh, they called cut coins sharp money or sharp shins. And if you talk to metal detectorists who detect in places like Kentucky or in southern Ohio uh, or to a limited extent in, uh, in Illinois, the Mississippi River Valley or in Tennessee, they find a lot of cuts that were probably cut in this era, 1810, 15, 20, uh, things of that nature. So it's no great surprise that uh, this Bank of Kentucky note uh, from 1820 actually depicted uh, not a 25 cent coin, uh, not a bust quarter, not a, a two real coin, but a cut one quarter eight real, because that was the, the typical um, small change money of the Ohio River Valley in that era. All right, I promised you place names were relevant. Believe it or not, there is a mountain in New Hampshire called Pistarine Mountain. Ask Dave Bowers. He loves this. Uh, Pistarine Mountain was apparently named for some reason after Pistarines. I have no idea the exact etymology, but what does it tell us? They knew what Pistarines were in New Hampshire. It wasn't just a Maryland and Virginia thing, uh, even though we know they were very, very common in the Chesapeake Bay region. Um, apparently they, they did actually circulate elsewhere or else someone in New Hampshire wouldn't have named a mountain after Pistarines. So there you go. New Hampshire also has an island called Stamp Act Island. So they were, they were in the mood of naming things in the 18th century uh, after things that, that you and I like to talk about and collect nowadays. All right, so we talked about sources. How about some methodology? Um, newspapers are, are interesting because newspapers are in many ways both a primary source and a secondary source. Uh, colonial newspapers um, printed a lot of hearsay, gossip, downright falsehoods, um, they recycled stories from elsewhere that, you know, they would subscribe to newspapers from far away and they would cut an article out and run it just like it was local. Um, so you end up with things like on, on the left from 1876, a newspaper article about a 1710 Mexican coin found in the middle of a piece of rock found in the bottom of the Rio Grande. I mean, there's probably some kernel of truth therein somewhere, but just like members of the press sometimes get technical aspects of numismatics wrong today, a lot of these kinds of articles about coins, particularly about colonial coins that were found, eh, say, mid-19th century to mid-20th century, they're very sensationalized. Um, they're not written from a knowledgeable numismatic point of view. You kind of have to read between the lines and figure out um, what's fact and what's fiction, that sort of thing. So you can contrast that with an article by an Associated Press or a writer from 1987 uh, recounting a news conference held by an archaeologist who found a, uh, a very early uh, Spanish copper coin uh, at a site associated with uh, Hernando de Soto uh, near Tallahassee. I would take that as gospel truth. I mean, that's that's as good as a primary source. Uh, that's as good as a, an archaeological uh, report. Uh, and if nothing else, it gives you a reference so you can maybe go find the archaeological report, find out what other coins were found, uh, this sort of thing. Uh, just because it was written by an Associated Press uh, writer doesn't necessarily mean that it's perfect, but it's a, a pretty good source. So you can use newspapers not only from colonial times, but also from the 19th century rec recounting things that were found or dug up or, or uh, uh, dug on a farm or something like that in that era. And you can use more modern newspapers as well. So this is an important thing to remember also. Um, the best evidence for low value coins, small change coins, is usually from those coins themselves um, that were lost that fell out of someone's pocket and are found either by metal detectorists or archaeology. 
the best evidence for higher value coins uh, is usually documentary. We know a lot more about the circulation of half Joes and eight escudos from things printed on paper than from finding big piles of half Joes dug in the dirt somewhere. Typically, we didn't we didn't lose those and not go find them. Uh, and it's important to know that that rich people leave paper trails, merchants leave paper, founders leave paper. Um, uh, famous political or military or, or economic figures leave paper trails. Poor people don't. Um, they weren't leaving um, big piles of letters that end up in the Library of Congress. So we often have to determine what was used by uh, lower uh, economic classes, working class people, poor people, enslaved people um, by archaeology, by lost and found, by trash pits and privies and things of that nature. So I have found a lot of source material in the last 30 years I've been screwing around with this particular subset of coins. Um, I always find new stuff. When I was putting together this talk, I just went digging around the internet looking for things I'd never found before. Um, whether you're looking for uh, posts on Facebook by metal detectorists or videos on YouTube of guys actually digging stuff up, be a little careful. Some people do plant coins just to increase their YouTube views. But whatever you're looking for, whether it's paper trails or physical coins, there's so much stuff out there to discover. So just get to work. Go looking, grab a metal detector yourself and start swinging it around. Uh, go through Google Books, go through eBay looking for old paperwork. You would be shocked at what you'd found. And uh, you know maybe you'll, you'll beat me and publish your book before I do because I've been working on mine for 20 years and it isn't done yet. So there you go. So uh, I look forward to hearing your questions. I look forward to you each uh, finding new information that I've never seen before. It is always exciting to find a new type of foreign coin that we never knew was here that we know because of some uh, metal detector find or obscure piece of paperwork or something else. So there's a, a real joy of discovery in this particular topic. And that's all I've got for you uh, at this moment. If you all wanna ask me questions, however you wanna do it, I am here to serve. Just let me know what you wanna know. Okay, well, you can go ahead and stop your screen share. And then for the audience members, you can send them in with the Q&A text chat at the button below, or you can click on the raise hand button, and then I will let you speak so you can actually have a conversation with John Kralievich. Uh, there we go. <laughs> okay, so let's see. Um, we have a comment from Jim Rosen in the Q&A. Pistarine Mountain in New Hampshire was given its name because it was sold for a pistarine. There you go. <laughs> cheap, cheap real estate. Thanks, Jim. And yep. hi, I miss you. <laughs> okay. What else? I was gonna say that's the only one up there right now. So go ahead and type things in the Q&A if you have them or just raise your hand and I will let you speak. We can do it multiple ways. Um, if you do wanna be anonymous, then you can check the anonymous button in the text Q&A. Come on, anonymous. We all know each other. We're all old friends here. Anonymous, yeah. nothing. come on. <laughs> Letting you people see option. my basement for, come on. <laughs> <laughs> there was a comment in the Q&A from Jeff Rock um, saying that you win for the best background on a Zoom talk, so. You're just jealous of my blunderbuss. That's what that's what that is. You just <laughs> uh -huh. and lots of books. okay. Well, while we're waiting for other questions to come in, um, my question would be: How did you first get started in this topic? Uh, actually, because I was a broke kid uh, playing in a junk box um, in in 1989. I can tell you down to the moment. Uh, in 1989, I was a page at the A and A convention. Uh, I was 11, and I cleaned a whole bunch of cases for a European dealer. And they said, "Look, we can give you a tip." or you can go grab a coin out of our junk box. And being a coin dork, I said, I'll take the junk box, please. And I found a real beat up uh, one real in there, a 1782 one real that I still own, uh, Carlos III. And uh, realizing this coin that was worth five or 10 bucks could very well have circulated in early America, uh, inspired me. I, I built exhibits around it. I did my first exhibit on this topic in I think 1990 or 1991. And I've been collecting this, this, this particular topic uh, and teaching on it ever, ever since. So uh, the, the neat thing about this stuff is, you know, if you want to collect colonials and you want to collect nice Vermont coppers or nice studios, there's, they're, they're expensive. Let's, let's be honest. And it's tough to get a very broad collection of, of red book type colonial material, unless you've got a, a pretty good amount of money. But if you want to collect Spanish colonial stuff or, or English half pence or French stuff, there's a lot of bang for the buck. You can get a lot of these coins for 50 bucks, a hundred bucks. I mean, if you want to get into gold, it gets a little more expensive. 
but uh, you can build a really broad collection that really kind of fills in all of the hills and valleys of the entire colonial era, going back from, from the earliest Spanish settlements and the earliest explorations all the way through the era of the Constitution and, and not spend more than a few hundred bucks a coin and end up with all sorts of fun stuff. So, And the paperwork is also really cool. I mean, you can buy this 18th century receipt that says I received from you two Spanish mill dollars. There's stuff like that on eBay for 20, 30, 50 bucks all the time. So uh, it, it takes more time to find it than money to pay for it, which makes the, the thrill of the hunt that much more. Mm -hmm. Okay, then we do have a hand up. Uh, Jack, you can now talk. If you go to the lower left-hand corner of your screen, there's a little microphone button. There you I, go. Am, I think I am unmuted now. Can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead. Hey, John. I'm sure I heard this talk when you gave it six years ago, but uh, I learned more stuff today, so thank you very much. Of course. Thanks for coming. My question is, are all those books behind you numismatic books? Uh, more or less. And there's, um, yeah. and there's more that you can't see. I mean, there's there's some regular old history books there, but they, you know, if they're in this room, they've got at least some kind of numismatic connection. But you know me well enough to know that I can find the numismatic connection in just about anything. So, uh, but yeah, they're they're pretty much all all coin books. There's 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 a lot I, of them. There's a I, I saw that. I'm jealous, very jealous. <laughs> well, come to South Carolina, and when the pandemic's over, come visit, and I'll let you poke around. I will. You're invited. Come on down. <laughs> Thank you. All righty. Uh, then if anyone else has a question, feel free to raise your hand or we have one in the Q&A. Q&A. He's asking about later 19th century coin chart manuals. Uh, they're absolutely useful. Um, they might not be useful um, uh, uh, when we're talking about the era of colonial times, but they're certainly useful in the era that they were published in. So, you know, if you get an 1840s or 1850s banker's manual, that's good insight into what kind of coins were circulating in the 1840s or 1850s. Um, a lot of this stuff was republished year after year after year. I mean, if you look at coin charts, uh, you'll see that things like the 1704 Proclamation Act, uh, those coins just get recycled and regurgitated on and on and on. And if you do this enough, you'll notice that certain almanac publishers recycle the same exact chart for decades. Um, so if you get into the coin charts of say the 1830s and 1840s, you might see that some are very dated in that era. Um, but there's some that have, you know, fresh, interesting material. Um, in that era, if you look at, say, the Eckfeld Dubois books, um, first from 1842 and then the, the second edition in 1850, they're interesting because they actually record the coins that came in for assay and deposit at the U.S. Mint. And a lot of those coins are quite old at that time. Uh, in fact, one of the brazier doubloons that came into the mint cabinet uh, walked into the mint uh, in a deposit. So those are interesting uh, because when you find a brazier doubloon in the sewer, uh, you might well try to deposit it as bullion. So, so uh, you actually have some things that are found as uh, single finds or hoard things that, that show up at the mint uh, in that era, but really uh, sort of tell more about an earlier time. So I absolutely think those later charts are, are relevant. Okay. What else? Uh, let's see, that's the only one there for right now. So go ahead. Oh, there's another number popped up. Right. Uh, let's see. <laughs> Ray, I miss you terribly. I wish we were all in Baltimore right now. And uh, I, I hope that, that Eric and I will be back at a future summer seminar. And you better believe that if we're back, we'll both be talking on this topic because Eric and I both love this stuff. So <laughs> absolutely. Uh, okay, Ed, from Jay Knipe, uh, what about merchants, account merchants accounts books showing coins in trade helps place a coin and its value in actual commerce? Absolutely. Uh, a lot of those kinds of account books tend to list money of account. So when it says, you know, I sold a beer for a shilling, they're talking about a Massachusetts shilling as opposed to the coin a shilling. So it's unusual to find those kinds of account books that actually record precise coin types, but sometimes they do. And when they do, they're, they're absolutely an important uh, kind of evidence. Uh, absolutely. So. Uh, Mark's got a question also, what is the most widely believed numismatic myth from this era that I'd love to thoroughly debunk? Uh, one I can come up with is a lot of old auction catalogs um, included Hessian coins and said these were the coins that were, you know, the Hessian blood money. They were used to, to pay Hessian soldiers. No, they weren't. No, they weren't. Absolutely not. We have absolutely, there's all sorts of, 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 of campsites where Hessians were serving alongside of British troops, and there's never been a Hessian coin come out of any of them. Um, which isn't to say German coins weren't here. I mean, it was a very large German population in Pennsylvania. Uh, German coins do turn up, um, but, but that particular one about, you know, blood money tollers, uh, 
I'll believe it when I see it. So that's that's one numismatic myth. Uh, and also, you, there's an idea that there were English coins in English colonies and French coins in French colonies. English coins, aside from coppers, weren't that commonplace here. I mean, you, you saw in McRoberts uh, letters from 1774 and 1775, Spanish silver was vastly more common than, than English silver. There was very, very little. And that was a, a purposeful uh, byproduct of mercantilism, whereby uh, the English coins were really intended to stay in England. And the Spanish coins that got here really came from trade with the Caribbean more than anything else. Um, so I, I'd like to see uh, uh, that debunked as well. The English coins were not that common aside from coppers. Uh, you mentioned documents addressing where and when eight reals were quoted. What is earlier evidence of this? Uh, well, I mean, the, the cut coins from the 18th century tended to be pistarines. They were, they were thin, they were light, and they turn up absolutely everywhere. Uh, we've got letters from, from Braddock in 1755, where he orders a large amount of, of pistarines um, as part of his efforts during what we call the French and Indian War, uh, where he actually talks about the, the, the fact that they were easy to fraction out. Um, in terms of large eight reals cut into quarters, that's actually kind of another myth. That was not, by and large, an 18th century phenomenon. That was much more common uh, in the 19th century than it was the 18th century. Uh, but that being said, we do find, uh, say, cut quartered uh, pillar eight reals. We do find those in Virginia archaeological sites. Um, they do turn up in New England to a smaller extent, Pennsylvania to a smaller extent. Um, but but that evidence of, of things like cut pillar dollars is more physical than documentary. Bob, I hope I see you soon too. Uh, I appreciate you being here as always. And, uh, and hopefully we can all get together before too terribly long. This is too long without a coin show and too long without seeing all your faces. <laughs> it's been a difficult year for sure. All right. Well. Okay. Oh, there we go. We got one from Jack. Do you think whoever made the Treaty of Paris medal also did some of the continental dollars? Now you're just trying to get me in trouble. That is that is well beyond the realm of this particular talk. But yes, I do think, I, you know, it's here's the thing. I would love to compare the collars on those pieces on the bet 614 to the the um, what we used to call continental dollars. I would bet the collar die is the same. Uh, I've never sat down with two of them in my hand and spun them around. I mean, heck, when was the last time any of us saw a raw continental dollar at this point anyway? It's not much use in a slab. Um, I would assume that they were probably made by the same people, but it is interesting that the, the, the dyes are not married or linked. But, but yes, my assumption would be uh, that they were probably came out of the same shop yet. Yeah. And that would not be that hard to prove or disprove, just again, using the edge, the edge collars in particular. Okay, we got a couple hands up. Uh, first up, we have Dennis, and I'm not even going to try your last name. I'll say it very wrong. Uh, Come on, so Dennis, <laughs> Dennis, Dennis, what's up? On the lower left-hand corner of your screen, you have a little microphone button. You'll want to click that to unmute yourself so we can hear you. Okay. Well, John, I happened to visit the British Museum a few years ago. And as you know, nothing is slabbed. I had my cotton gloves on. Nice. All right. I had three continental dollars in my hand with exactly, along with the uh, other piece. Yes, that's 614. Yeah, the Felicia, I have to think what it is, but... Yep. So I had them all in my hand. I did exactly that, and I couldn't convince myself they were the same. All right. Well, Doesn't there. Mean it there. isn't the same, but I couldn't convince myself they were. Well, and the Bet 614 in the British Museum is fabulous condition, too. So if that one didn't convince you, probably the scruffy ones that we sometimes see at auction wouldn't convince you either. Yeah, well, like I said, I, I, I just wasn't convinced. It's not definitive, but I just wasn't convinced. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we might, we might have to study more of them, but no, I appreciate that. And Jeff, yes, the same shop in England, Mr. Mr. Smiley Winky Face. Um, is there one place or places that summarizes metal detector and ground finds in North America or a database? No, uh, I started that book 15 years ago doing exactly that. My, my goal with the book was twofold, to catalog all the various things that were found here. Um, but I ended up getting overwhelmed by information because there's so much. I mean, every time you find one archaeological dig report, you end up looking at the bibliography and finding 50 more. And it's like, at, at some point, I have to, you know, sleep or go to work. So um, there's not a database. I've been keeping one in sort of a disorganized way myself for years and years and years. Uh, ideally, I'd like to publish it somewhere. Uh, but with the internet, uh, this was a lot easier when there wasn't so much information. With the internet and with metal detectors being able to share what they've found, it, there's just been an explosion of, of this kind of information. Um, but, but yeah, maybe, maybe someday some kind of database will, will get published. Uh, another question, are there any references about early French or Spanish coins in St. Louis and New Orleans? Yes. 
uh, there's there's both physical and documentary. Um, there are uh, archaeological digs um, in St. Louis, in Kaskaskia, Illinois, in New Orleans, in Mobile, um, all up and down the, the Gulf Coast, um, both military and commercial sites that have yielded a lot of cool information. Um, they found things that we would might expect, things like 1721 and 1722 nine deniers that are listed in the Red Book, uh, things like 1720 souls, uh, things like the 1717 pieces. Um, but there's also a lot of good documentary evidence in St. Louis, that evidence of the documentary stuff tends to be 19th century, uh, tends to be first quarter of the 19th century when St. Louis really started to blow up. Uh, the New Orleans stuff, um, there's a ton of it. Most of it's in French, um, but but there's been a lot of very, very good cataloging of those original sources um, in, in various archives. Um, so yes, tons of information about, about the Gulf Coast and the lower Mississippi River Valley. Uh, and it's interesting the extent to which that is most, much different um, with a, a much more French feel with many more French coins, but also the same. There's also uh, the stuff we would see from the Caribbean. I mean, New Orleans was essentially a Caribbean port in many ways. Um, still the preponderance of Spanish colonial silver. Um, so it was very much American, but also very, very much French. Um, and interestingly, if you look at the at the Planters Bank uh, countermarked cut uh, eight reals uh, that were probably made around uh, 1811 to 1815, most of those are on uh, Mexican Revolutionary uh, or War of Independence uh, cut eight reals um, that uh, apparently because they were cast or crummy looking uh, were were inexpensive to import to New Orleans. Of course, New Orleans was funding a lot of that effort on behalf of the, the Mexican rebels, uh, but that's the primary undertype for those Planters Bank pieces. So that's another uh, interesting source um, uh, from New Orleans, just albeit a, a slightly later era. Great, and then we do have one more hand up. So Wayne. Wayne Shelby, you can now unmute yourself. There's a microphone in the lower left-hand corner. <laughs> Wayne, you, know, you know more about what foreign coins are found in the dirt in New Jersey than anybody else alive. So I should be the one asking you questions. <laughs> How you doing, JK? Enjoyed Good your man. talk. I uh, just wanted to mention that uh, Eastern Shore, Virginia, and the South, you get all the pistarines. That's right. And, yep. uh, and I did a count on everything in South Jersey that I've found. I don't know how many Spanish pieces I've found. I think I have in my last article 117 Spanish pieces. Wow. Now, out of those, only 10% are pistarines. Interesting. Yeah, it's a much more Caribbean phenomenon. And I, I, I'd be hard-pressed to explain why. But but yeah, that's that's true. I mean, South Jersey was a much more... Philadelphia related economy and you get down into Maryland and Virginia and it's like all pistarines all the time. And um, cut, forget it. I mean, out of those 117, one regal cut piece. Really? That that yeah. is interesting. Yeah, that's that's much different than the Chesapeake or or further west. I mean, further west, we can kind of understand it. These river towns were trafficking in large volumes of large coins. Uh, and in order to get small change for the little towns along the river, the only way they were going to get them was to cut up the big coins because nobody was shipping, you know, bunches of one reals or bunches of two reals that far away. Um, but mm -hmm. it, it, it is interesting that there are so few cut pieces in places like South Jersey and Philadelphia, whereas there's so many in Virginia and Maryland. It's, a, it's an unusual phenomenon. But I have uh, cut eight reals. I never found a, I never found a regal eight real, right? Yeah, I have nine or 10 pieces that are cut that are counterfeit that were plated. So I don't know That's if they cool. used them or tossed them. And they could be either. I mean, we certainly see cut counterfeits that were cut up to literally throw out. Uh, but I think that people may well have cut them just to get rid of them, too, and, you know, make them small change. Interesting stuff. You got to put all that in a book, too, man. The articles are great. We want a book. Yeah, well, maybe we'll both work on it. We'll have it out by 2050. Yeah, that's probably about right. That's about the timing I'm working on, too. <laughs> awesome. Nice to Thanks, hear your voice. All righty. Thank you, Wayne. Here we go. Uh, let's see. Okay, I think that was the last hand we had up, and we don't have anything else in the Q&A. Uh, awesome. So I believe that wraps us up. Um, thank you very much, John, for taking the time to give your presentation. It was very informative. and. Thank you everyone who has tuned in. We hope to see you again tomorrow. We'll be starting at 2 p.m. Eastern tomorrow, kicking things off with Jim Glickman with Colonial 101. So a bit more of an introduction, that one. Um, so I think that wraps us up for tonight and hope awesome. to see you all tomorrow. Thank you for moderating. Thanks for coming, y'all. Bye. Bye-bye.